the fifth army in italy the first army with elements already on german soil the ninth the third and the seventh all fighting beside british and free french and other allied forces in the pacific the sixth army and other elements in burma General Joseph Stilwell's command of American, British, and Chinese jungle fighters were driving back the Japanese, opening the way for completion of the Lido Road, which our army engineers were building as a land supply route to the embattled Chinese by way of India. In Russia, German armies were in retreat before massive Soviet counterattacks. To use an old army expression, we were clobbering the enemy on all fronts. But it was no grand march, no sudden sweep to victory. For as the aggressors were driven back, their resistance increased along with mounting desperation. We paid a price for every mile we took. The battle for Germany was on. For the Germans, their Goethe Demerung. The twilight of the gods had come. Our armies were battering at the gates of the Nazi homeland. General Hodge's first army drove through the vaunted Siegfried line. Mile upon mile of concrete fortification and anti-tank emplacement through the city of Aachen. Two years and seven months after General MacArthur had left the Philippines, he kept his promise to return. On the 20th of October, 1944, his forces invaded the island of Leyte. This, too, was to be no easy parade to victory. Our soldiers were to face an enemy who would fight as their leaders ordered them to fight to the death. They wanted it that way. They were to get what they asked for. Seven days after MacArthur landed on Leyte, the United States 3rd and 7th fleets dealt the Japanese Navy its death blow in the battle for the Leyte Gulf. was rising on the last fast-moving act of the drama of World War II. General Patton's Third Army took Metz. Ahead was the nearby Saar Basin, Germany's second most important industrial district. On the other side of the world, Army B-29 bombers from new bases on Saipan showered bombs on Tokyo. A fiery rain from the heavens to avenge Pearl Harbor. The campaign on Leyte was going well as our forces moved on, capturing the Japanese base at Ormok along the west coast. Other forces landed on Mindoro Island with no losses. While General MacArthur's forces were driving forward in the Philippines, 
Patton's Third Army penetrated the Saar and drove on across the Saar River. A record-breaking fleet of 1,600 United States heavy bombers blasted Frankfurt and other German cities. The Nazis were reaping a bitter and devastating harvest from the seeds they had once sown from the air. Now the very perpetrators of aerial blitzkrieg saw their own cities reduced to rubble. To the millions of Nazi war victims, here at last was a measure of retribution against their merciless executioners. Some of the bitterest fighting of the war took place on the Cologne Plain. Our push toward the industrial roar was resisted every step of the way. Then, on the 16th of December, 1944, the German counteroffensive struck. German Field Marshal von Rundstedt suddenly sent a dozen elite divisions smashing into the Ardennes sector. cast the dice for high stakes, crossing the Meuse River, driving toward Liège, and trying to cut the Allied communication lines from Antwerp to the front line. If our lines of communication could be cut, the fate of our armies might be in the balance. This was the Battle of the Bulge. Combat and non-combat troops were suddenly and necessarily fighting side by side in worsening winter weather. Grabbing their weapons, they dug in and responded to the old military axiom of hanging on to buy time until reinforcements would come. General Eisenhower took immediate action to meet the crisis. He put the 1st and 9th Armies north of the Bulge under command of Field Marshal Montgomery's 21st Army Group with orders to attack from the north. Patton's 3rd Army was to attack from the south. Two airborne divisions were rushed in. The 101st was ordered to hold the vital communication center at Baston. It was during this action in besieged Baston that General McAuliffe, who was then commanding the 101st, made his famous reply to the German demand that he surrender. That reply was reportedly one word long, nuts. If the enemy did not immediately understand the meaning of McAuliffe's typical American reply, the action which followed undoubtedly convinced him that it meant that the Americans had no intention of surrendering. Just six days after von Rundstedt had launched his counteroffensive, Elements of Patton's Third Army, racing up from the south, struck the German on his southern flank. The pressure was off the 101st Airborne. The 
first American army attacked from the north. After the British struck the bulge on the west, the third army smashed on north up with the first army. Then the weather cleared and our planes took to the air, blasting von Rundstedt's forces. of the bulge was soon over. The enemy was retreating. The Germans had thrown their last big Sunday punch of the war. The Battle of the Bulge was going on in Europe. The 8th Army, commanded by General Robert L. Eichelberger, was battling stiff Japanese resistance on Leyte in the Pacific. The fight for Leyte would continue for months until nearly 50,000 fanatical Japanese would be annihilated. Our forces were spreading out in the Philippines. Sixth Army troops landed on Luzon in the Lingayen Gulf and swept southward to capture Tarlac, only 65 miles from Manila. Fifteen days later, men of the 1st Cavalry Division fought their way into Manila. The capture of Manila included the Santo Tomas prison camp. Along with the Filipino people, these prisoners had waited in long and quiet agony for this moment of liberation. Of all the liberated peoples in the world, none showed more gratitude than did the Filipinos. They well knew we had come not for conquest, but to keep a solemn promise to return and destroy the aggressor who had taken over their homeland in a war of conquest. Less than two years later, the Philippines would be given complete independence as a sovereign nation by the United States. Thirteen days after the fall of Manila, our airborne troops landed on Corregidor. Two years and nine months after the Japanese had hauled down our flag. It had been a long and bloody road but we had returned. Who and where were those who once had said the American was no soldier, that he would not fight? the world, climactic events were swiftly gaining momentum. Our 9th Army, under General Simpson, crossed the Rhine on the 2nd of March. Four days later, General Hodge's 1st Army occupied Cologne. 
Four days after that, 300 of our super fortresses blasted Tokyo. By the 17th of the same month, General Patton's Third Army had taken Koblenz. The next day, and half a world away, our troops invaded Panay Island in the central Philippines. Three days after that, Patton's Third Army crossed the Rhine. Four days later, General Eichelberger's Eighth Army was landing on Cebu in the Philippines. Less than a week after that, on the 1st of April, 1945, the United States 10th Army, under General Simon Buckner, invaded Okinawa. On the 11th of the same month, the 2nd Armored Division of the 9th Army reached the Elbe, only 63 miles from Berlin. The 3rd captured Coburg. On the 12th of April, death took the Commander-in-Chief, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He had lived to see the triumphant advances of American arms, but fate had denied him the satisfaction that final victory would bring. Less than a month after President Roosevelt's death, Germany surrendered. Hitler was dead by his own hand. Only a few days before, Mussolini had been killed by Italian partisans. To his home shores, General Eisenhower returned in triumph. But in the Pacific, a war was still going on, a big and bitterly fought war, with the end not yet in sight. Okinawa was a bloody battleground, as our 10th Army was finding out. continuous fighting to take Okinawa. Kamikaze attacks on our Navy took a heavy toll, but we fought back, never letting up.
the military might of the United States would now be concentrated on the Japanese homeland. A tough job lay ahead, a job that would take men and equipment. Our entire military strength was now aimed at the one remaining Axis partner. Our military planners estimated that in an all-out assault upon Japan itself, our invasion forces would probably suffer a million and a half casualties. But a new and terrifying force had come into the world which was to prevent those million and a half casualties, the atomic bomb. Two of these awesome weapons dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki brought Japan to her knees. On the 2nd of September, 1945, Japanese officials signed the Articles of Formal Surrender on the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay. The Formal Surrender by the Japanese on the 2nd of September, 1945, marked the end of the shooting in World War II. It was a momentous, historic event. But there was one other that followed, which might not have been as historic to the world at large, but it was probably the most rewarding moment in the life of a fine old soldier. General Jonathan Wainwright, who had been forced to surrender Corregidor, had been rescued by U.S. Army paratroopers from a prisoner of war camp in Manchuria and flown back to be present at the formal surrender on the battleship Missouri. A day or two after that, he was present at the surrender of General Yamashita and the remnants of the Japanese army in the Philippines. It must have been a great day for Jonathan Mayhew Skinny Wainwright, West Point, class of 1906. American soldiers.